Patrick. Thank you very much uh, for accepting my invite for this interview. I would like to say that I have been following you now for, let's say, about three years when I discovered that my son is mouth breather at night. So at that time, I didn't know, let's say, anything about it, but it was strange to me. I, I know that something is not right. So I started Googling and looking, researching. So I also discovered you, I read your uh, book, The Oxygen Advantage and other article, podcast and so on. So I started to help uh, my son, also me. I discovered I was and am at night uh, mouth breather. I discovered all these consequences uh, with crooked teeth, um, yes, or um, and yeah, neck posture and maxilla development and facial structure and and so on. Um, so yeah, at that point I started to follow you and you. And can you can you tell us just a little uh, bit about you, who you are, and how did you start with uh, this topic? I think as a asthma uh, asthma challenge challenge you to do that. Can you please explain more about that? Sure, Anya. Um, I came across by accident. As a child growing up, I had always a stuffy nose. Yes, me too. And it's very common. It's very common in children, maybe about 30 to 40%. And because the nose is stuffy, you don't breathe through it. So any child with a stuffy nose is going to switch to mouth breathing. And as a result, then the child is going to have the mouth open both during the day and also during sleep. And the problem with the child with the mouth open during the day is that persistent mouth breathing during the day can alter the shape of the face and it can cause a narrowing of the facial structure, overcrowding of teeth and an elevated palate whereby the roof of the mouth is infringing or going up into the nasal cavity. Also with mouth breathing, the jaws, because the face is longer, but also the jaws are set back and the airway is compromised. So children who have their mouth open typically don't thrive as well as a child with their mouth closed. And there is quite a lot of documented research on this. But despite this, most people do not aware of it. You as a parent- Why, why doctors are not aware of this? Uh... I don't know. I really don't know the answer to this because I could pull up different papers. There are different studies. There was a study conducted in the United Kingdom that was published in 2012 in the journal Pediatrics. And it looked at 11,000 children with sleep disorder breathing and mouth breathing was a contributory factor. Children with sleep disorder breathing, including snoring, these children, if untreated by age five, they had a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight, 40% increased risk. And we have to bear in mind that a child's brain is growing. It's in development in the formative years and if the child is having sleep disorder breathing, it has a long lasting impact negatively on cognitive development. And I'm, you know, it's, it's very sad that doctors- but There not is not this. enough space. There is not enough space also. Like um, I'm bones not sure. aren't developed well. That, that part of it, I don't know. But mm -hmm. in terms of cognitive development, and I'm not sure exactly like what's chemistry, happening. chemistry factor. Just the uh -huh. development of the brain, development of the mm -hmm. brain. So it just doesn't happen the way it should do if the child isn't, isn't having a good enough sleep. So to make a long story short, mm -hmm. I was a mouth breather all the way through my childhood years, into my teenage years, into my early 20s. And I was constantly fatigued. I had poor concentration. And I was in that fight or flight response. And mouth breathing it really has a big impact on your sleep. Like I used to wake up in a dry mouth every morning and I would wake up tired and my snoring was really hard as well. So I came across an article written in an Irish newspaper back in 1998. And the newspaper article said two things, breathe through your nose and don't breathe hard. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't doing that. I was going around with my mouth open 
and you would hear my breathing from maybe two meters away. Mm -hmm. So I did the exercise to open up my nose because you can open up the nose by simply holding the breath and nodding the breath. Why do you do shift with your head? Just oh, a distraction. Okay, okay. That's all. So yeah. it just makes it easier to hold the breath for a little bit longer. So it's a distraction. And then I switched to nose breathing. And that night I wore breathe right strips on my nose to help open up my nose. Mm -hmm. And I wore tape on my mouth, mm -hmm. get my mouth closed. And the first morning I woke up, I was still getting used to it. And the second morning I woke up and it was the best night's sleep that I had in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was onto something. And it was because of the changes in my own health that I decided I would like to train in this field. So I changed careers. I changed careers. My background is a university education in economics. Mm -hmm. So I completely changed careers to teaching breathing exercises. So how is asthma connected? Like if you breathe uh, through your mouth, asthma can more easily develop. Yes, well, it aggravates asthma. And if we think of the human asthma. nose, so if we think of the human nose, we have to consider that if we look at the anatomical model here, so you see the nose and the face and you, you see the lips here and you see the chin. And if we look into the mouth, there is no function provided by the mouth in terms of breathing. Mm -hmm. So you have, say, any person, not just somebody with asthma, but any person, if they breathe in through their mouth, that air goes straight down their throat into the lungs. But if they breathe in through the nose, the air is warmed, the air is moistened, the air is regulated, it harnesses a gas or picks up a gas called nasal nitric oxide. Breathing through the nose is connected with the diaphragm breathing muscle. Mm -hmm. Breathing through the mouth has got greater amplitude of the upper chest. Fast breathing using the upper chest is causing agitation of the brain. So for a person with asthma, if they are breathing through an open mouth, they are taking cold, dry air into their lungs. And this in turn then is causing the airways to constrict. And it is very normal for somebody with asthma to breathe through an open mouth. And the reason that they breathe through their mouth is because they often feel that they are not getting enough air through their nose. The person with asthma, we know since 2007 that if there's a problem with the lungs, inflammation in the lungs can travel up to your nose. And if there's a problem in the nose, the inflammation in the nose can travel down to the lungs. So since 2007, it's been recognized that the airway is a unified airway. Whatever happens in your nose travels down to the lungs and vice versa. And it's also known that if you have a stuffy nose, you are 1.8 times more likely to have a sleep problem. So I, as somebody with asthma, and any of your listeners who have asthma, and asthma is relatively common. It affects about 8% of the population. So almost 10% of the population have asthma. Many of them will mouth breathe. Many of them mouth breathe during sleep. They will be tired. And because of their chronic mouth breathing, they have poorer dental health. And also because of their mouth breathing, they are breathing faster and upper chest breathing, and they are more likely to be anxious. But where it starts, like mouth breathing, because it's not natural to the animals, it's true. Right. What about dogs? <laughs> Dogs are the only species. Just cooling. And the, cooling dog is, the, the dog has the mouth open to cool down. Yes. Um, so it's not natural in the animals and it's not natural in the humans. Correct. True? Then uh, what happens with, I, uh, I think, modern humans? This problem. We, it's modern humans. It's something that our ancestors didn't do. Mm -hmm. Our ancestors were innate nasal breathers and they had much better development of the face. Mm -hmm. And it may be due to a number of things. Number one is eating processed foods. Number two, eating very soft foods. Number three, if a baby is born tongue tie, as I have a tongue tie, uh -huh. the child can't get the tongue up into the roof of the mouth and importantly for feeding. So if the baby is tongue-tied, the child is not able to feed from the mother very well. And as and a result... It cannot be cut. 
It can be, but who most people don't know that. Most parents are not aware of it. In Ireland, if a baby is born, no, no one looks into the child's mouth to see if the tongue is tied. And it's overlooked. Again, you know, something that's so simple is completely, it's absolutely, in my country, totally overlooked. I'm not sure how it is in Slovenia. It may be that your healthcare professionals observe this, but the problem with a tongue tie is a baby cannot feed from the mother. The baby then starts chomping on the mother. It's very uncomfortable for the mother and the baby then isn't getting enough, is not getting enough milk. And as a result then, and a bottle is introduced. So the baby then is taking milk from the bottle. However, breastfeeding is not just about nutrition, but it's about manipulation of the muscles necessary for craniofacial development. So to get milk from the breast, it's helping to form the baby's face. And we need babies with good muscle tone, you know, but many babies now don't have good muscle tone because they are not eating, you know, the, the food that we are eating is not what our ancestors eat. You know, we are eating food that is pretty much chewed, pre-chewed food. Yes, you, you support baby-led weaning um, method of... I do, but it's not the easiest thing to introduce yeah. either because we try to introduce with our own child and between mother-in-law getting upset and between different people getting upset because you're giving a child harder food and they have a gag response mm -hmm. and you're always a little bit anxious about this as well is it okay for mom to to chew for the baby a little bit the heart or the meat the heart food possibly possibly yeah um i, I did it, it you did it and <laughs> it, it's it's possibly the best way to do it but it didn't work really well with us however we were very conscious of um my own daughter breathing in and out through her nose and also during sleep from a young age during sleep and also then embarking on functional orthodontics to help develop the palate because i didn't want her to make the to have the same mistakes that i had during my childhood because it is not good for concentration it's not good for stress levels and it's not good for academic achievement any child who's tired that child is not going to do well in school no matter how hard they try because how can you concentrate when you're tired we cannot do it as adults it's very difficult if we are tired it's very difficult for us to concentrate mm -hmm. and yet we are not asking the question does my child have snoring or is my child stop breathing during sleep what is the quality of sleep of my child and i remember dr christian gimeno he is one of the founding fathers of sleep medicine. He died last year and he spoke about the critical importance of restoring nasal breathing in pediatrics. And I was giving a talk in Bordeaux in France. He spoke there and I remember him saying this. He said, we need engineers. We need professional people. But he said, our children are mouth breathing and their brains, in quote, their brains are getting fried. But this, sorry, these professional people should be, um, should be the first parents themselves. Yes. You agree? We are the greatest example for them to follow. If we mouth breathe, then it's logical that children learn this. Um, totally. Yes. Totally, totally. But I have also, let's say, then adults say to me, I can nasal breathe, I have deviated nasal septum and um, sinusitis, rhinitis. So um, what solutions do you have for the children and for the, uh, for the adults um, to start um, nasal breathing? Can we it's, change as adults? Um, yes, of course. I have a deviated septum. Me too. <laughs> you know, it's so common. 60% of the population have a deviated septum. And even if you have chronic rhinitis and sinus issues, you can still really, really help it by practicing breathing exercises. One exercise people can practice to help open up their nose mm -hmm. is this. Don't do this exercise if you're pregnant. 
-hmm. And don't do this exercise if you have serious medical conditions. But if you want to open up your nose, take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out through your nose, pinch your nose with your fingers, and gently nod your head up and down as you hold your breath. And keep holding your breath until you feel a strong air hunger. And then let go, but breathe in through your nose. And you wait 30 seconds. So you breathe normal for about 30 seconds to one minute. And you do it again. And you repeat it times? Six, six times. Six times. Yes. So anytime the nose is stuffy, do that exercise. Now, the wonderful thing about the human nose is that the more we breathe through it, the better it works. Mm -hmm. So if any student comes in to me, I will show them how to decongest your nose. And then I say to them, I need you now to breathe through your nose 24 hours per day. Mm -hmm. And if you continue breathing through your nose, your nose will work much better. But at the beginning, you might feel that you are not getting quite enough air. Because if, you have, if you've been breathing through an open mouth for five years or for 10 years, and now all of a sudden we're closing the lips, we're breathing in through the nose, we may feel a slight air hunger. Mm -hmm. And the exercises will help to calm that down. But if you continue breathing through the nose, the air hunger goes away. And even during physical exercise, it's really important to breathe in and out through the nose, not to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth, not to breathe through the mouth, but to breathe in and out through the nose. And it would be useful to combine this with diaph diaphragmatic breathing, costal diaphragmatic breathing. Yes. To well, calm down the nervous system. Yes, correct. Um, we know that the mouth is directly linked with the upper chest. And you also don't know that mouth breathing contributes to forward head posture as a compensatory mechanism. Now, I often say to my students to look down at their chest and to take a breath through the mouth. And if you look down at your chest and you take a breath through the mouth, typically you will see that there's movement from the upper chest. So when we do breathing exercises, I focus on the biochemistry first. I get people to slow down their breathing and breathe less air to deliberately allow carbon dioxide increase a little in the blood because this helps to reduce the chemosensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide but also it helps to calm the central nervous system because if we have an individual who is breathing fast and upper chest breathing the central nervous system is aroused so we start really slowing down breathing and we reduce volume breathing and we do that for a few days, different times, different exercises. And then we have the, our students put our, their hands either side of the lower two ribs at the nine and 10. And as they breathe in, they should feel that the ribs are gently moving out. And as they breathe out, they should feel that the ribs are gently moving in. And we ask them to do it very lightly. So as you breathe in, the ribs are moving out. And as you breathe out, the ribs are moving in. And as they do that, then we ask them to soften their breathing. So you can breathe light, you can breathe slow, and you can breathe deep. So we use the acronym LSD. So LSD, people will generally remember it. And it's light, mm -hmm. it's slow, and it's deep. Yeah, um, I know my breathing uh, was from always loud breathing. I remember from the school days, uh, my friends say, I, I cannot concentrate, I, all, I just hear you breathing. <laughs> and I still think it's, uh, it's difficult um, to learn. And um, we should also nasally breathe when, uh, when eating, when talking, when singing, running, doing sports, because I don't know any runner here who breathe through uh, his nose and if i say something they said you are you are crazy you go go to maximum uh, effort it's not possible to nasal breathe yes but if yes. you keep breathing through your nose your body adapts to it 
and Professor George Dallam. He's a professor of sports medicine at one of the universities in the United States. He got 10 recreational athletes. He told the athletes, I need you to breathe through your nose during all physical training for the next six months, and then I will test you. And after six months, they were able to achieve 100% of their work rate intensity breathing in and out through the nose. But what's more, the fraction of expired oxygen was less. Their body utilized oxygen better because nasal breathing increases oxygen uptake and increases oxygen delivery. The carbon dioxide in their blood was higher with nasal breathing than with mouth breathing. And also the ventilation was 22% less. So these people were able to achieve 100% of their work rate intensity with 22% less ventilation. Now, even if you have an athlete, why not spend at least 50% of the time breathing in and out through the nose? Nasal breathing increases oxygen uptake, increases oxygen delivery, less trauma on the airways. If we are doing exercise with the mouth open, we are drying out the mouth, we are drying out the throat, we are drying out the airways. This can contribute to head colds, chest problems, exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, and also the link between the nose and the diaphragm and the function of the diaphragm, not just for respiration, but also for the generation of intra-abdominal pressure or stabilization of the spine. So it's really important for functional breathing and functional movement. And if breathing is not functional, movement is not functional. And if movement is not functional, the athlete is at a greater risk of injury. So the athlete who was doing all of their physical exercise with their mouth wide open, they, that, it does not make sense. So at least change 50% of breathing to in and out through the nose. Now, talking, it's not always easy. Before talking uh, about running, let's say sprinting. Uh, I just was thinking about when mouth breathing uh, is okay. Let's say there is a lion and we have really uh quickly run away is this okay it's normal to breathe, uh, with the, with our mouth uh so if we pass uh, if we pass away we don't feel the pain something like that is is there uh, any situation mouth breathing is natural or or good it's mouth breathing is normal when the intensity gets so high mm -hmm. when the intensity during physical exercise mouth breathing is a stress response Traditionally, our ancestors did it when they were in fight and flight. And, you know, mouth breathing is faster breathing than nose breathing because the nose during rest slows down breathing. And slow breathing is very important for calming the mind. Whereas mouth breathing, fast breathing, stress agitates the mind. So nose breathing is slow breathing and lower breathing and mouth breathing is fast breathing and chest breathing and it was okay in times of fight or flight that we switched to mouth breathing throughout our evolution however we live in different times today and our ancestors were typically not exposed to the long-term stresses that we have today our ancestors when they had stress it was short term if there was a tiger, they either ran away from it, it was short term, or the tiger ate them, it was still short term. So, you know, nowadays it's chronic long term stress. And chronic long term stress has such a negative impact on the human being. We cannot cope with long term stress. It, it, stress makes us sick. And with heart rate variability, biofeedback, since the 1990s, we can clinically measure stress. And even individuals who have gone through a divorce, their heart rate variability tends to be lower. Individuals who are mentally not well, if they have anxiety, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, they have reduced heart rate variability. People who are physically unwell, asthma, COPD, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, obstructive sleep apnea, 
rheumatoid arthritis, they have reduced heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is a clinical measure of vagal tone. So how well is the vagus nerve functioning? And we have this nerve wandering throughout the body, innervating all of the major organs. And most of the information from the vagus nerve is sent from the body back to the brain. And this is where slow breathing can be very important because when we slow down our breathing, the communication from the body back to the brain is that the individual now is breathing slower and the brain interprets this as everything is okay. And the brain then will send communication that everything is okay. So when we breathe slow, we are tricking or we are telling the brain that everything is okay. But when we breathe fast and when we breathe stress, the brain is monitoring that and the brain is relaying signals of agitation to the rest of the brain. So how we breathe is very important for our state of mental health. And we can improve our resilience by breathing through the nose, by breathing light, by breathing slow. And longer and exhales. Longer exhalation, typically one and a half times the length of the inhalation, but also by breathing deep or by breathing low. And resonant frequency breathing, which is another dimension of breathing, that when we slow down our breathing to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute, it's the optimum practice to stimulate the vagus nerve and to exercise pressure receptors in the major blood vessels to influence the autonomic nervous system to get a balance between the parasympathetic and sympathetic response. Also with humming, vocalization. Yes. Humming is here. very important. Mm -hmm. And humming, for example, we're vibrating the nasal cavity. It generates more nitric oxide, which is very good for respiratory health. And it also stimulates the vagus nerve. And other ways of stimulating the vagus nerve is splashing the face with cold water, gargling, singing, singing. Can you do these exercises looking sideways with eyes? I don't know those exercises. Okay, I will send you. Excellent. When I cannot sleep um, at night, I, I get up and I have some biofeedback meditation with heart rate variability measuring. Uh, I like these toys. Mm -hmm. So I do and I see this um, resonance, resonance scoring. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, let's say I am 49%. Then just with two free breaths, it goes up to 80, 90, almost 100%. And mm -hmm. it takes 10 minutes and then I go to sleep normally. Yes. I, do. I like to follow this breathing indicator. Uh, indicator uh, to tell me how to breathe and uh, to listen um, this biofeedback, biofeedback meditation guided. So I uh, calm down and go, go to sleep. And how does it tell you to breathe? Does it tell you to slow down your breathing to five seconds in and five seconds out or what does it do? Yes, mostly this uh, exhale to be longer than inhale and to slow down. Uh, yes, I, I get also to four or five breaths per minute, something like that. So then yes. I, I feel the difference in whole body. Yes. Uh, I am I'm a completely different person. Yeah, this is really how is the breath, the bridge uh, between mind and body. Yes. And this is for the people who doesn't study this stuff, uh, I think difficult to understand. Well, the try. best way to understand this is to put it into practice. You know, breathing has not got a good name. And it hasn't got a good name because so many people messed it up. Many people who were teaching breathing exercises told their students to breathe more air, mm -hmm. to take full big breaths. And it was not good information. Because hyperventilating. Exactly. Exactly. And this instruction was gave in psychotherapy. This instruction was also gave by some yoga instructors, Pilates instructors, and other, other individuals who were teaching breathing. If we teach breathing, 
we need to understand the impact that the breathing exercise is having on the biochemistry of the blood on the biomechanics mm -hmm. and also on the autonomic nervous system. And if we have a basic understanding of the physiology of it with the biochemistry, we can ask people to gently soften and slow down the speed of their breathing to allow carbon dioxide to increase a little in the blood. And you know that carbon dioxide is increased when you feel air hunger. But carbon dioxide is not just that waste gas. As carbon dioxide increases in the blood, the blood vessels open up. So we have 70,000 miles of blood vessels throughout the human body. And if we slow down our breathing and breathe a little bit less air and feel air hunger, we can improve our blood circulation, but we can also increase oxygen delivery to tissues and organs, including the brain. And it's been known since 1924 that carbon dioxide is a calming gas. It was known as a narcotic gas, that it brings a quietness, it calms the central nervous system. When we breathe hard and fast, and when we breathe too much air, it causes too much carbon dioxide to be removed from the blood through the lungs. And this causes the central nervous system to be aroused or agitated. So the biochemistry of breathing is very important. If you practice yoga, if you're doing Pilates, if you're doing different techniques, the rule of thumb is you should not hear your breathing during rest. Do all of your yoga with light breathing. Do your Pilates with light breathing. And then you will improve the biochemistry of your blood or the biochemistry breathing from a biochemical point of view. And the biomechanics then, we can concentrate on that by breathing low. That as we breathe in, and lower ribs and posture. As we breathe in, the lower ribs move out. And as we breathe out, the lower ribs move in. Also the, the head posture. Head posture as well, of course. Um, and unfortunately, computers don't help with that. Mm -hmm. And mobile phones don't help with that. And then if we practice breathing in and out through our nose, and all of these exercises are breathing in and out through our nose. But if we slow down the breathing to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute, this is when it helps to influence the vagus nerve or stimulate the vagus nerve. So we need to look at breathing from a wide perspective. What can it do? But the one thing about the breath is that it can influence many of the functions of the human body, which are normally outside of our control. And I've seen people with high blood pressure. I've seen them slow down their breathing and within minutes, their blood pressure started to reduce. I've also seen people with low blood pressure by slowing down their breathing that it helped to normalize their blood pressure. I've seen thousands of people with asthma and typically I would expect that they need 50% less medication in three months, even if they had asthma for 30 years. For people with panic disorder, for people with anxiety, many of these people 75% of them have poor breathing patterns and they also and often have poor sleep. We can never achieve a calmness of the mind unless we get good quality sleep. How can you be calm if our sleep quality is not good? And there are thousands of people with anxiety and panic disorder. They are breathing hard. They are breathing fast. They don't have a good night's sleep. And they, they're using cognitive therapy to help calm the mind. But the instructor is forgetting, the practitioner is forgetting about their breathing. We cannot forget our breathing, about our breathing. The asthma doctor should not be forgetting about breathing. You know, the human nose was specifically designed to condition air on the way into the lungs. And despite that, it has been overlooked. And this is a question where I am often, for 20 years I've asked the question, why? And I will tell you why. Because it doesn't promise to make big profit. I can guarantee you this. If healthcare professionals made a lot of money from teaching breathing exercises, they would teach breathing exercises. 
but you do not make a lot of money by teaching breathing exercises. And that's the reality of it. It's not that breathing exercises don't work, they do, but it's difficult to make money from teaching breathing exercises. And also, Patrick, there is uh, another point of view um, I studied lately, the gut macro ma microbiome. Mm -hmm. If we sleep well and if we lower the stress by breathing, mm -hmm. uh, also our gut bacteria is less stressed, so function more properly. And since our gut bacteria is connected with uh, every cell of the body mm -hmm. because of the mitochondria, which is um, ex bacteria, they affect um, all our body, all, uh, all um, potential um, illness is coming from the gut. So there is another important connection, I think, yes. between breathing that's, and gut microbiome. And that's a question that I have overlooked. So there's everything in the human body there's bi-directional yes. and that's why i think it is important to to approach it from from a wider viewpoint and they yeah they are talking about this really pandemic of modern human like this leaky gut syndrome mm -hmm. you heard about it yes. and yes and from leaky gut syndrome we can have all the same um, potential problems you mentioned before you now all these um, health problems so I think this connection is also very important. And if we go back, you were talking, you started talking about talking and breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you want to say about how to nasal breathe and talk? It's not easy. It's not easy. And the rule of thumb is that I would say with talking is never hear your breathing. Mm -hmm. we, I don't breathe through the nose with every sentence. It is not possible. If I was to breathe through my nose with every sentence, I would talk like this. I would take a breath in and then I would talk and I would talk until I need to breathe in again. And then yeah, I would stop. Now deviated septum. Yes, but it just makes the conversation too boring. <laughs> so I think it's important that it's, have balance. it's, it's a balance. Mm -hmm. It's a balance and singing the same. You know, you can breathe through your nose during singing. It's very important for protection of the upper airways. But most singers, it's not, the problem is not how they breathe during singing. For most singers, the problem is how do they breathe when they are not singing? Mm -hmm. How do they breathe when they go down the street? Singers need their voice. They need to protect the upper airways, which house the vocal cords. But they sleep with their mouth open, many of them, mm -hmm. and they are traumatizing the upper airways all night long, <sighs> waking mm -hmm. up with a dry mouth in the morning, trauma to the vocal cords, and then they've got increased mucus, they've got inflammation of the upper airways, and that's going to impact their voice. And the other thing about singing is that it's very important that they have very efficient breathing. And that they are able to hold their breath and sustain a note for a long period of time. And breathing exercises can change that. And again, it's not about taking the deep breath. And it's not about taking the big breath that often we hear. Mm. Uh, Patrick, what do you think about, um, if we talk uh, about children and tonsils problems, uh, because the doctor want to operate them and uh, parents and doctors all think that they have breathing problems because of this enlarged tonsils, but it's vice versa. It could be. <laughs> what, do you what do you suggest to, to, to parents with that kind of problem? Well, I think I give my example was that seven or eight years ago i did not know all of the information with regards adenoids enlarged adenoids and tonsils and my three-year-old daughter at the time when i watched her sleep she would stop breathing and i said okay this is a problem because this is sleep apnea mm -hmm. and i asked an ear nose and throat doctor to examine her and he said that the adenoids were enlarged and he said we need to remove the adenoids so we had our adenoids removed, we had our tonsils removed, 
But the ear, nose and throat doctor never said anything about restoring nasal breathing. And I knew about it, but thousands of parents don't. And according to Dr. Christian Guimano, there is a 65% worsening of the child's sleep frequently within three years, unless the child restores nasal breathing. But the ear, nose and throat doctors, unfortunately, all they do is remove the adenoids and tonsils. They don't restore nasal breathing. Now, if I was to, to wind back the ears and to do it again, I would not have brought my doctor to an ear, nose and throat doctor. I would have brought her to a functional dentist. And I would have brought her to a dentist because the problem is not just that the adenoids are enlarged. The bones. The problem with my daughter was that her jaws were not forward enough. Because when we look at the adenoids, it's a lymphatic tissue located right at the back of the nose. So this here is the adenoids here. Mm -hmm. Now if the maxilla, which is the top jaw, if that's well forward enough, even if, we, if the child has enlarged adenoids, the child is likely to be able to breathe through the nose because they've got good development of the face. But if you have a child with an airway that's compromised, so she inherited my genetics, so her jaws were set back. So when the adenoids are enlarged and the jaws are set back, it's a problem. It's not just about the, ad the adenoids, the problem is about the jaws. And the efficacy of adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy was only investigated according to one paper in 2010. And this paper looked at 578 children. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull it up because people often say, well, you know, show me the science on this. So I'm just going to pull it up. I wasn't prepared for this one. So just bear with me one second. And I have to try and find. I yeah, what just... you're, you're searching. I, I, I read about it, that the, the tonsil, the soft tissue developed for, uh, for the maximum capacity, like written in genes. But the bones, uh, the bones not, the bones grow according to the use of the muscles. So we don't have enlarged tonsils or adenoids, but we have two small bones to fit yes. the tonsils. Yes. If you've read about that in English, I would like you to send it on to me because that's what I'm writing about at the moment. But I'm going to show you just, I don't know if that's come up on your screen. You should see yes. a manual there. Now, the overall efficacy of adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy in, in the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea in children, it's unknown. Now, by the way, this was written in 2010. So despite decades of removing tonsils and adenoids, that the efficacy of it was not, was not known until 2010. So not all children with adenoid tonsil, tonsillar hypertrophy suffer from obstructive sleep apnea. So this is a paper published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. And they looked at 578 children. And I'm just going to move on. 50% of the children were obese. And tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, it resulted in a significant AHI reduction from 18 events per hour down to 4.1. But here is the real issue. Of 578 children, only 27% of them had their sleep apnea cured. 73% of them continued to have sleep apnea, even though it was less, but they did continue to have residual sleep apnea following tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. Now because we, the problem is still, is still there. The problem is that the airways need also development. Yes. And if we look at this, this paper here called Mouth Breathing, Nasal Disuse and Pediatric Sleep Disorder Breathing, it was published in Sleep and Breath in December 2015. The persistence of mouth breathing post tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy plays a role in the pro pro progressive worsening of the AHI index. And it frequently occurs within three years. And if I move on, the treatment of pediatric obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing means restoration of continuous nasal breathing during wakefulness and sleep. And if nasal breathing is not restored, despite the short term improvements after adenoid tonsillectomy, continued use of the mouth breathing route 
may be associated with abnormal impacts in airway growth. Now, this was written by Dr. Christian Giemann, he's the lead author here. And the title of the paper is Towards Restoration of Continuous Nasal Breathing as the Ultimate Treatment Goal in Pediatric Sleep, sleep Apnea. Now, despite that, most doctors are not aware of it and most parents are not aware of it. Mm -hmm. So besides, uh, besides these exercises we were talking about, you have developed um, this hey, yes. device. How did you develop that? We had a, I've been working with children for many, many years. And to give you an example, but say for example, we've been working with children for years. I have this. And we teach them various breathing exercises. But what could we do when the child is sleeping at night? night. And we need to bring the lips together. And the other thing is with adults who have anxiety, how can we have bring their lips together? So there's a few things about the taping. Number one is you have a main muscle surrounding the mouth, mm -hmm. the orbicularis oris muscle. Mm -hmm. And the muscle fibers are going in this direction. They're going from left to right, vice versa. Mm -hmm. When we put on kinesio tape or we put on elasticated tape, we are stimulating the muscles to be more active. So that's one thing. Number two, for children who are mouth breathing during the day, we have them wear the tape. And every time that they forget to close their mouth, if they open their mouth, the tape automatically encourages them to breathe through their nose. And the tape is safer than taping the lips because it surrounds the mouth. So it's elasticated, it's cotton. Mm -hmm. And we feel there's a tension there. So it's pulling the lips together to ensure nasal breathing. So it brings the lips together, but what about the, the tongue? The, the tongue the, the also important. The tongue also needs to be trained. Mm -hmm. Just getting the lips together does not train the tongue. So we ask children normally to do tongue pops. Uh -huh. And we ask them, well, where did you have your tongue to get that sound? And they say, my tongue is in the roof of the mouth. And that's where we say your that's where your tongue should be all the time because our tongue has got two places to be it's either in the roof of the mouth or it's falling back into the airway so we do want children and adults breathing through the nose jaws relaxed tongue resting in the roof of the mouth okay um so Let's say adults who also want to, to uh, nasal breathe and yes. have this tone posture. Um, and if they have already long face and uh, uh, straight, uh, how do you say? Feet. Yeah, this. Um, oh, a high palate. High palate, yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, instead of you, um, this letter, this letter, uh, how, how can we train? And also bad, uh, bad neck posture, um, promote the bad tongue po posture. Well, but doing these exercises and trying always to remember the tongue, the roof of the mouth, can we, as adults, adults change um, the maxilla, this bone, uh, I, I'm not totally sure. I don't think so. I think that once the face is developed, that it's grown. However, there is a growing movement with Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Mike Mew called Mewing. And chewing seems to be able to, by exercising the muscles of the face and the mouth, that chewing seems to be able to guide or have some influence on the growth of the jaws. What about myobrace and this stuff also? The myobrace and myofunctional myofun therapy, functional orthodontics, mm -hmm. that will have probably, you know, that will have an impact. And um, there's no doubt that functional orthodontics 
with a palate expander, which is developing and widening the maxilla, that has an impact. Um, so, you know, I think it's, I would like, if, a, if a, an adult comes into me today and I say that they have their mouth open, I say it's vitally important that we get the mouth closed. I don't know if it's going to improve the growth of the face, but it's going to improve their dental health because mouth breeders have dry mouths, more gum disease, more dental cavities. It's going to help improve their airways. It's going to help improve their sleep. It's going to help improve calmness of the mind. It's going to help improve exercise tolerance. There are so many, many benefits to this. You know, no adult, no child should be breathing through an open mouth. You know, it's really, sleep apnea is, is relatively common. And if an individual is, has any person who wakes up with a dry mouth in the morning, they are not likely to have a refreshing sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to wake up in our moist mouth. The problem with uh, apnea that um, we can develop Alzheimer's disease. Yes, it is linked. Yeah, the brain is not cleaning uh, the amyloid plaques and... Yes, yeah. yes, so the lymph lymphatic system. Yeah, the lymphatic system. Is where the brain is cleaning, cleaning, cleansing itself during deep, mm -hmm. deep sleep. Yes. But if we breathe with an open mouth, we have shallow and light sleep. And it is known that we have much deeper sleep when we breathe through the nose. That's correct. Um, and talking about kids and uh, these steps, uh, if, we, if we have kid um, mouth breathing, uh, does this help eventually uh, to to teach him or his uh, lips to be closed at night yes. at some time or yes yes it's really important breath. for children that they wear it during the day as well as during sleep uh -huh. and it's by wearing it during the day for about 30 minutes a day that it's a training tool training. to train Mot the brain yeah. motor training yes it's really really important because otherwise it used to be very frustrating with, for me. I would teach breathing exercises for the children. We could open up their nose. We knew they could breathe through their nose, but it took a lot of work to change the behavior. It's not just enough to open up the nose. It's not just enough to restore functional breathing. We have to change the behavioral pattern. And the taping during the day, I started it going back maybe four, maybe five years ago. I would say to parents, I really need you now is when your child is at home, especially when they are distracted, if they are watching TV, if they're reading a book, if they're playing games, to have tape on them out. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's when they are distracted that we are training the brain that the nose is for breathing, not the mouth. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, okay, this is very important also for the brain because by, by maybe understanding, seeing that tape, then we learn, learn the body, how to use the, the lips. Yes. Yes. So in, in, is there any time, you know, like four weeks, two months, three months, six months? Well, habit, habit oh, formation. Habit formation is typically 60 to 70 days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen before that. And um, that's why with the tape, we have 90 strips. So for an adult, it's 90 days. And for a child, and sometimes adults will continue wearing the tape. I wear tape on my mouth at night. I don't need it, but when I tape up my mouth, I'm assured, and there's a psychological thing as well, that I get a deep sleep. Yes, it's completely different. You, you, you wake up with uh, clean mouth and yes. you, you, you feel the different. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, for the end, just maybe one thought about food and connection with breathing. Let's say junk food uh, yes. is, is also yeah. important. Yeah, you know, good food has less of an impact on breathing. I don't know enough about food. I'm not a nutritionist. But what I would say is, from the limited knowledge that I know, if we eat good food, it has much less of an impact. And good food meaning vegetables, most fruits, and vegetables. Some meat, of course, is important. Um, but junk food, 
processed food. Like even alcohol, I drink alcohol, but alcohol I know has not a good impact on breathing. If we drink a few beers, our breathing is harder and faster that night. Our heart rate is elevated. And so you know, the pH levels are different. I think it's more, I think it's more than just the pH. I just think it's the, you know, it, it, I don't fully know what's happening, but certainly it's, you know, the alcohol is certainly the worst for the impact on breathing. For sure, the, the, the lungs are helping the livers to, to deal with. Yes, this that could be it. Okay, great. Um, so, um, can you tell me just a little bit about uh, your new book, uh, which is coming now? Sure. The new book is looking at topics that I didn't include in the previous Oxygen Advantage. And we put in a big chapter called Women's Health because women's breathing is different to men's breathing. And since 1905, it has been known that women during the monthly cycle, post ovulation, during the luteal phase, days 10 to days 22 of the monthly cycle, there's an increase in progesterone, which is a respiratory stimulant. And carbon dioxide levels at that time can drop by 25%. So the female is hyperventilating for almost two weeks of every month. And this will contribute to increased pain, reduced pain threshold, fatigue, anxiety, and exhaustion. So PMS, so symptoms, premenstruation symptoms, are aggravated by dysfunctional poor breathing. And many females experience this and there has been no breathing program for females. So that's so one chapter. There is a connection between breathing and estrogen level in the body. There is an impact on it, but I'm not sure if estrogen is, is the real factor. I think it's more so progesterone. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to be the progesterone is. Now, there could very well be. And I know I've written about estrogen, but overall, I think it's coming back to the progesterone. And it's very, you know, in terms of this, and then we had some emails coming in from females who were post-menopause and they were having hot flashes. And anecdotally, when they got their mouths closed, the hot flashes reduced. So I think there's certainly some way that we were able to impact the autonomic nervous system. And women's breathing needs more attention than men's because of the hormonal intricacies. Like more women experience fibromyalgia than men. More women have temporomandibular joint pain than men. And it has been taught, especially with fibromyalgia, that you can have a female who gets diagnosed for, with fibromyalgia between days 10 and days 22 of the monthly cycle, but they are not diagnosed with fibromyalgia at other times of the month. What about endometriosis? That I haven't looked into. I haven't looked into it and there could be a connection there, but I haven't looked into it. So there is a chapter on that and uh, there's a chapter also on functional movement. There's a chapter on epilepsy. There's a chapter on type one diabetes. There's a chapter on the vagus nerve. There's a chapter on sex. So there's a chapter on other topics that I haven't covered in the oxygen advantage. There's a huge section on sleep and there's a significant section on children which even though I did talk about children in the oxygen advantage, I only gave it one small piece. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really, this new book will be about health. And the previous book is all about performance. Oh, very, very interesting. Um, what about, uh, just for the end, I, I thought about uh, all these breathing problems, over breathing stress, and uh, mask wearing uh, with this COVID situation could be useful one hour of uh, mask wearing a, a day for calming down the system, uh, like a training. Yes. Uh, yes. The masks are fine. You know, people are giving out about wearing a mask. I wore a mask last Friday, Saturday, Sunday for four and five hours at a time. It's fine. You know, it does pull carbon dioxide. You will feel a little bit of an air hunger. 
your blood oxygen saturation drops a little wearing the mask, but that's because of the increase of carbon dioxide, which is causing more oxygen to be re released from the hemoglobin to the tissues. So wearing of the mask could, could actually be a training tool because you're, you're exposing your body to slightly elevated carbon dioxide. And by doing that, you're reducing the chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. Now, many people wear a mask and they wear it because it's mandatory in, in public places, for example, or at least if you go into restaurants. But the air hunger while wearing the mask, they switch to mouth breathing and they breathe shallow. Ah, that's bad. And that's the wrong thing to do. So, you know, you have air hunger, breathe in and out through your nose, but breathe light, breathe slow, breathe deep. So you're much better off really breathing slowly and lightly and low, and that will get rid of the feeling of air hunger. Okay. Uh, Patrick, where our listeners can, can find you um, and all this uh, interesting stuff, podcasts, interviews, books? There's two websites. One website is butecoclinic.com, and we have a children's program for free. So all of the children's breathing exercises are free of charge anyway. And um, we then have workshops for asthma, workshops for sleep apnea, workshops for anxiety. And then for sports performance, it's oxygenadvantage.com. So there's different ways of people to make contact. And we are on Instagram, Buteco Clinic and Oxygen Advantage. Mm -hmm. Are these workshops are online or... Yes, yes, there are two hours. So basically, I hold workshops, say, for people with sleep apnea, with snoring and with insomnia. And they sit in for two hours. And during that time, then I guide them through each of the exercises. So it's a small group of people. I don't teach one-to-one -one because I just don't have the time. Um, but we do teach a, I teach a small group of people. And I can give them feedback and we can... It's a lot of practice, practice of the exercises just that people, they kind of feel comfortable that they are doing the exercises correctly. Okay. Patrick, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your time. So sure. thank you for all your knowledge, for all your uh, work effort. I really uh, love your work. Uh, so thank you for everything. And I hope we'll do another podcast with your new book. Or Great, something. that yeah. would be good. Okay. Thank you very much, Aya. Bye. Bye-bye.